You're listening to Little Things with Great Love. I'm Devon Steele. The violence started on a Thursday evening. Ethnic Indians were being attacked in the streets, their vehicles stoned right in their own neighborhood. It was Durban, South Africa, in 1949, the age of apartheid, or literally, apartness. Native Africans were carrying out racially motivated attacks, and the Indian community was struck with fear. One Indian family, the Mudleys, were fleeing their home. Palani, the father, rushed his children out as rioters ran through the neighborhood, attacking Indians on sight. One of the older siblings had a truck parked in the next yard. If they parked it on their own property, they were scared rioters would burn it. The younger siblings, seven or eight of them, not understanding what was happening or why they were leaving, were piled into the truck. One of the family's older sons, Chawi, grabbed the important family documents, including their birth certificates, stuffed them in his coat pockets, and ran for his life. While the younger children in the truck drove away to find safety, the rioters chased after Chawi. As he struggled to outpace them, they managed to tear away his coat with all the family's documents in it, or so the story goes. He escaped with his life, but everything that identified him and his family, everything that said, we are here, was lost forever. That night, the Mudleys were forced to sleep on the police station floor. And as Palani lay on the station floor that night, surrounded by his large family, fragile, but all alive, he must have been thinking things his young children could not understand. Where could they belong? Did nobody, black nor white, want them there? What was going to happen to them? And what if they didn't get so lucky next time? It wasn't fair what had happened to them, of course. But who was out there to say they cared, that their people and problems mattered? In the riot's aftermath, the Mudleys eventually returned home. Their house had been damaged in the violence, but not as badly as others. That's because the Mudleys' domestic help, who lived in the basement, was himself a black man. And he told the rioters that he was the home's owner, and that he rented it out to other blacks. So it was spared the worst. The 1949 Durban riots took a massive toll on the Indian community. 142 deaths, not just Indians, but of all races. 1,087 injured, thousands of structures damaged, and 300 buildings burnt completely. Countless unrecorded cases of looting and rape, and 40,000 refugees created in three days. These numbers only begin to capture the long-term damage of the riots, damage which caused a wave of suicides in the Indian community, and years of families falling apart, harassment, reprisal, and discrimination. The riots not only defaced and displaced, they erased. But Indian South Africans weren't going to go away that easily. There's a lot of vegetable here. You don't have to use two. But for your recipe, if you want two cups, you have to I'm use. in my grandma's kitchen in Chipuktuk, the Great Harbor, or Halifax, Nova Scotia. The traditional home of the Mi'kmaq, Halifax has been home to my grandmother since she immigrated from South Africa in the 60s. Today, we're here to cook budgias. These crispy, golden, deep-fried bites are vegan and gluten-free. They're crunchy on the outside, pillowy soft on the inside, with just a bit of spice. And they make for irresistible finger food, the kind where you plan to have three or four, but end up scarfing the whole plate. So how long do these cook for? It's a, a few minutes. A judgment thing? You have to look at the yeah, color? Yeah, look at the color. You'll see what I'm doing. But as far as I know... Grandma's recipe has never been written down. Today, we're here to change that. 
And don't worry, if you're not writing this down, we've made sure to attach the recipe with detailed instructions in the show notes. So first, you'll need some ingredients. I'm gonna put that two onions and this spinach and uh, some green onions and coriander. Now it's time to get a large pot, turn up the heat and get out your frying oil. Medium. I'll, I'll get out, I'll chop up the rest of the stuff. So how much uh, oil do you put in? You need quite a bit, otherwise it won't cook mm-hmm. properly. Enough, okay. enough to cover the whole yeah, thing? Yeah, the whole thing. Two small medium onions, mm-hmm. two cups of spinach or whatever. If you don't have spinach, this is my idea, nobody's. You put one cup of shredded iceberg lettuce. I surprised the people in South Africa with all my (laughs) different ideas. Where do you come up? I said, I try. Once you have all those crunchy ingredients chopped up, it's time to dice up a jalapeno pepper. Half if you don't like much spice. All of it if you like it medium. And if you really like a good kick, make sure to add the seeds. Time to add the ingredient that really makes it sing. This is cumin. About one teaspoon. One teaspoon cumin, yeah. Mm. Spices hold a special place in my family's history. Not only are they a part of our cuisine, of course that's true, but grandma's father, Palane Mudli, was, among other things, a spice merchant. Why did he go to South Africa in the first because place? Because he was, uh, what they call it, indentured, so indentures. Yeah, indentured laborer? Yeah, laborer, yeah. So what... He came by the boat. Uh, white people used to come and deal with my father because he mixes it the way they want it. They'll stand there and watch my father do it. So do you think because he had all the spices that was easy in your home to have all the spices you wanted? And yeah. That's why food was so Always important. different families use different spices. What I have, all my sisters will have because this is basic for us. With his various businesses, Palani and his wife Mariama supported their growing family, which would eventually swell to 15 children. Can you tell me what it was like growing up in Durban, in your family? What kind of house did you live in and and what was your schedule like? Okay. We had a very large house with four bedrooms, very old-fashioned but very nice house, big house. The yard was very large, it was like a farm, but in central Durban. Did you have any animals? Oh, all kinds, except cow, and we had rabbit, duck, birds, pigeons, tortoise, everything. So you would keep those, and then... As a pet. As a pet, oh. Yeah, yeah, we didn't. You didn't keep any to eat? Okay. Grandma remembers celebrating Diwali every year with delicious feasting. Diwali, all we do is light lamps, clay lamps all over the window, all outside. Decorate the, the whole house, always big, always fireworks. Food is galore. It was like a buffet style. They put it outside on the lawn. We all bring everything and everything will be so much. It's a big celebration. But that childhood innocence would come to an end. As South Africa's white government developed the set of policies and laws, modeled after ideas in Canada's Indian Act that would become apartheid. So what do you think it was like being Indian in South Africa at that time? It was okay. You didn't know any better. (coughs) Then gradually it got worse. Mr. Prinslow, what is the basic philosophy underlying apartheid as a way of life? 1927, Liquor Act. Indians may not serve liquor nor work in the liquor trade. It started with a protest march by some 400 native women on the police station. 1927, women's franchise bill. No Indian women are allowed to vote. The general principles of British democratic government form the basis on which South Africa is governed. 1927, 
Nationality and Flag Act. Indians are not considered South African nationals and cannot become so by naturalization. 1934, the Slums Act. It claims to improve living conditions, but actually expropriates Indian property under the guise of sanitation. 1937, Marketing and Unbeneficial Land Occupation Act No. 20 Transfall Asiatic Not Tenure on Regulatory Indians are prohibited from employing whites. 1943, the Pegging Act. Indians cannot acquire or own property in areas reserved for whites for three years. When those three years are up, it's replaced by the Asiatic Land Tenure and Indian Representation Act, lovingly called the Ghetto Act of 1946. 1949, prohibition Indians of cannot mixed purchase marriages land from non-Indians. Indians a marriage are granted between permission a European to and a non-European may not the House be of Assembly and one senator. And any such marriage so solemnized in contravention of the provisions of this section shall be suppression of communism. No effect. The, the Communist Party and propagation Soviets of communism becomes illegal. But really, this bill sanctions 48 of groups the government sees fit. Group among the many, many people. Separation on the basis of race is becomes Nelson mandatory for property ownership I know work and work and race. The new boundaries created for areas cut through existing boundaries and led to the eviction of thousands. Indians are forced out of the central city where they operate as a population registration act. All South Africans must be racially classified as separate white, amenities black, act or color. This creates the criteria for each was based on appearances and social acceptance and descent, washrooms, including measuring jobs into a buttocks, shoving pencils ourselves. into curly hair and asking the person to we shake their head, the and pinching people to see in which language they said, ouch. Schools are segregated, hospitals are segregated, every aspect of life is designed to create distinct tiers of society. But when you were a kid, you didn't really think about that sort of thing? No. Nobody thinks about it. Nobody has the money and nobody worries because that's how you live. See, the people say, why would I move? I have been living here for so long. And it's dangerous and everything else. But uh, because Papa got money from other people to get out of the country, we couldn't afford it. Thanks to the help of a wealthy patron, my Papa was able to leave South Africa to earn his PhD in England. Here was his chance at finding a better life, to find a better future for his children. I was afraid at that time. Somebody come and rob you, stab you, break into your house and all that. You have to always look over your shoulder. And I said, why? Why do we have to go to different school? Kids go to this school and that school, you know. We all should go. And I know from reading that in England, it's not like that. And so a few years after Papa had gone ahead to begin his studies, the whole family packed up and left South Africa for good. How are you chopping the onions? Just roughly? Roughly. Just you need good pieces, not fine. I chop one medium onion in five. Mm -hmm. And then just chop them up. Now that all your veggies are chopped, it's time to make a batter. That's the chickpea flour. Oh, this is chickpea flour. Okay. I buy the egg one. Where do you buy this from? Walmart. See, I don't measure, but I told you two cups. Yeah. Quarter teaspoon baking powder, quarter teaspoon baking soda. Salt, uh, I put in tasty. Pinch of sugar, that's it. If you put extra water, you just add a little more flour. Mm -hmm. Cold water, eh? not warm water. A splash of cold water. For grandma, Arriving in London must have felt similarly, after a lifetime so far lived in the global south. So when you visited London for the first time, was that your first time ever being outside of South Africa? Yeah. So what, did, what was it like flying in a plane? And... Oh, flying in a plane alone, but also it's so large, you don't know what to do and all that. Papa met me there and all. 
But then after that, uh, you get used to it. Not long after, Papa graduated and pursued job prospects in Canada. Eventually, the family settled down in Chipuktuk, or Halifax. So when you first moved there in 69 or so? Yeah, 70s, early 70s, so yeah. what was happening? People were throwing eggs and only in my dining room. We didn't know where it was coming from. Mm -hmm. Then when the police was there, he found out it was coming from across the river, somebody on the tree there, up on the tree. That's why we can't see people. It's dark, right? So they used to throw it. I don't know why. I don't know why. And I said, because we are Indians. Grandma worked hard at several different jobs to support her children. Her and Papa divorced. The children grew up. New cousins were born. Old cousins passed away. South Africa's apartheid policies crumbled, and the Republic of South Africa was born. Nelson Mandela became its first president. The world moved on. First, I'll mix all this and break the onions. Not too thick, not too thin. So you just put it in the water for... Yeah, about me. half a cup I put now. Yeah. Fast forward to the present. We move on to other news tonight and to the coronavirus and news this evening that the dangerous South African variant Canada has, now has detected its first case of the City South African variant of COVID-19. Tonight, the South African COVID variant is spreading in in the US. In the over Overworked and exhausted, undertakers say they cannot keep up. Manufacturers of coffins are working overtime to make up the shortages and meet demand. Traveling back to South Africa becomes more and more difficult for grandma as the years pass. The pandemic makes it even harder. Earlier in the year, bad news came with every phone call. And in the last several years, much of grandma's generation has passed on. Yeah, I get lonely because people don't visit unless you invite them. But I like the lifestyle that you live here. Nobody bothers you. People don't come unless they call you. And if people need help, they'll call. So do you feel connected to South Africa or you feel like it's very no, disconnected? No, I'm, I'm still connected to South Africa. I miss them a lot. I call often and uh, yeah. sometimes I think, why am I here? Finally, all the ingredients have been mixed together, the batter's been made, and it's time to fry your budgies. It's ready. How do you know that the oil is ready? See, it came up when I put a little bit. Yeah. It came you, up. You if just, it didn't come up, then it's not ready. The oil not ready. So you just drop a little bit mm. and see if it floats and starts to yeah. get crispy. Otherwise, you can put chopstick there and see if uh, it bubbles. Using a teaspoon, drop in a dollop of your mixture into the oil. Oh, that sound is great. And just like that, something small but revolutionary has taken place. For as long as humans have been displaced, or otherwise left behind the place they call home, they've been carrying on their traditions, remixing them, and teaching them to younger generations. They've been carrying out little acts of remembrance, one bite at a time, for something that's been lost. I asked Grandma what happened to her childhood home. White people took over, Group Area Act, they call it. They took over the house, asked them to move out. Yeah. So who would live there now, would you say? Nobody lives there now, it's just a highway. It's, like. But it's been torn down. Yeah, right? all the houses torn down. Yeah. Grandma is just one person, someone who was caught in the winds of history, which were far beyond her control. And there are no monuments commemorating what happened to her. But we have food to remember. We have food to share and to pass on. We have these little monuments that say we were here and we're still here. History cycles on. The world keeps spinning and it's hard to keep up. But at least we have the good times with one another. It was to cycle, to play dragons and dungeons. 
Uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. D and D. She said, "I'm going for D and D." Yeah. Both my roommates uh, used to play D and D. Oh. Yeah. What is it? It's a game. Yeah, it's a game. Oh. Um, it's like a game without a board. It's sort of hard to explain. There's, there's like charade, no. Not like charades, no. We can only keep going, day to day, dish to dish. We're only little drops in the ocean, and one drop can't turn the tide. So maybe we should focus less on doing great things. Instead, we can do little things with great love. You've been listening to a short audio documentary, Little Things with Great Love, written and edited by me, Devon Steele. We've included a detailed recipe for budgias, including tips for troubleshooting, so you can check that out and bring some of Grimm's cooking into your home. We've also included a few recipes for quick, delicious sauces to dip your budgias in. Again, I'm Devon Steele, and I hope great food and great love are in your future.